Okay, so what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about the mathematics of the homework. This is where the class becomes quite challenging as this is a 100 level course with people who may not have even taken calculus or may have been several years before you've done calculus, as well as a 300 class that counts towards the math department requirement for the major. And so I'm trying to make sure that there's math at both levels. Yeah. One of the things we are going to do today, I believe, is talk about the problem that changed me from being primarily a physicist as a student to being a mathematician. Just the sheer power of yeah, it. Yeah. And it is my chance to try to proselytize and try to convert you to mathematics. If that doesn't work, don't blame mathematics, blame the messenger. All right. So what I want to talk about today is the homework. So we had a couple of different homework problems. And so hopefully this is you know, somewhat viewable. And so the first one was to look at the regular season standings in the American League East yeah, it's already done. team, find the exponent C, such that the run scored to the C over run scored to the C plus runs allowed to the C, so does as good of a job as possible for fitting the observed winning percentage. And see how this varies from team to team. And then we do this for the regular season in um, 2019. Okay, so the first one was 2020 and the second one was 2019. Which year do you expect a better fit and why? So what year do you think is gonna be a better fit? 2020, 2019? Good, why is 2019 better? See, there's more games played. There's almost three times as many games in 2019 as the COVID shortened season in 2020. So the more data points you have, the more you expect things to be settling down towards their true value the smaller sample you have. Let's imagine you're trying to figure out who's going to win the presidential election. So you decide you're gonna sample one person. What kind of estimates are you going to get? So here's some people with bad estimates. Yeah, exactly, you're gonna have this incredible support for person X. And you could, could be a third party candidate. You could have somebody who's undecided. But if you only have one data point, it's going to be very unlikely to be reasonable. Uh, continuing the stream of Asimov stories, if somebody sends me a reminder, there is a good, of course, Asimov story about surveying just one person for the presidential election. And I will try to find and share that story with you. All right, so we have confidence that it should be better with more data. That doesn't mean it will be, but odds are it will be better. The more data we have, the more confident we are, the more comfortable we are. We like having lots of data. And so the question is, how would you figure this out? And so uh, let me, I think I have to stop the share and then move to doing it this way. Okay. And so I've tried to punch up um, you know, a little bit of you know, the solution to the homework. And so, you know, I start off by looking at the American League in 2019 and 2020. I really should tell you where I got this data from, right? I'm doing a bad job as a professor. Can you forgive me? Why can you forgive me on this? And if you say it's because my son was sick, that's not a good excuse. If you say it's because my audio wasn't working, that's not a good excuse. Why am I off the hook for not giving you a source for this? You're the professor. Uh, you found the same evidence. Okay, so I mean, I, I really should have a link as to where this is coming from. But what can you say about these numbers? Yes. They're not going to change. Is this going to be controversial? You're not going to have people who are insisting that the Red Sox won 98 games in 2019. Right? We are not going to have disputes like that. Very, very different than a lot of the discussions going on with COVID. I should still do it. It's bad on me. If I was grading myself, I would probably either take off a point or say, you know, bad, bad, whatever. But it's so standard here that I was a little bit careless. You should knock into those habits, but these numbers aren't going to change. And so we were able to find the final standard. 
Now, the next one is a little bit hard. You know, how do you get how many runs were scored or allowed? And depending on what website you go to, you might have the information in different formats. And this is one of the things we constantly see again and again and again with algebra. Depending on how you have the data, some ways are easier than others. We're using once as input, how many runs do you score on average per game? How many runs do you allow on average per game? If I have a website that tells me how many runs were scored, and I know how many games were played, this is not rocket science. I can just have some Excel columns, and I can divide one by the other, and hopefully I do it in the right order, and I get something that looks reasonable for runs scored and runs allowed. But by doing a little bit of searching, I actually found a website that had as their data how many runs you know, a team was scoring and allowing on average, so I could just go straight to that. And so if I try to solve the equation, so for the Baltimore Orioles, first alphabetically in the American League, and I apologize to my friend who is a Orioles fan, this is about the only way they will be first in the American League East. Uh, 4.5 to the C over 4.5 to the C plus 6. Point, oh, that's a typo. It should be 6.06 .06 to the C equals 0.333. And the problem is if we try to solve this using techniques you've seen in previous math classes, this is not an equation we can solve in nice closed form. And this is one of the points to take out of something like this. We can't always get exact answers. However, we can often get answers that are good enough for all practical purposes. And so one of the things we could do is, you know, I can plot various things. Um, and you try to see what's going on. Let's see which plots do I have here. Another thing we can do is we can do a little Excel notebook. And so I'm going to share the Excel notebook and talk about how we would use that. Okay, so what I have here is I have C, I have my prediction, I have my observed, and I have my difference. And so over here, what you can see is I take 4.5 and I raise it to the C. So here would be 2.3 and divide by 4.5 to the C plus 6.06 .06 to the C. And I just fill that down. And I look at the observed, and I look at the difference. And we see that the difference goes from positive here to negative here. And so what we're using is a beautiful theorem from calculus called the, anybody know? So what theorem are we using? Intermediate value theorem. Intermediate value theorem. If you have a continuous function, it can't go from positive to negative without going through zero. Or another way of saying it is if you are five at time zero and 12 at time one, then you have to hit every speed, every distance between five and 12 as you go from zero to one. There's no transporter. You can't go discontinuously from one point to another. <laughs> Is it possible you could go from five to three and then up to 12? Absolutely. Maybe you forgot something from home and you circle back. But you know that you must go through every point from five through 12. And so because this is a nice continuous function in C, we will know that somewhere between um, 2.32 and 2.33, it has to hit zero. Is it possible it hits zero between 2.27 and 2.28? If this is the only information you know, sure, maybe it was positive, crashed down to zero, crashed back up to positive, and then continued. Now, if you look at the function, and if you look at the plot, you see that, the, that it's moving in one direction as C changes. So this should not happen with the data that we're looking at. So we know somewhere between 2.32 and 2.33, there's gonna be a crossing. Is this enough data? Well, we basically have the integer part and we have the first decimal part. Let's do a little bit more. Let's go from 2.32 to 2.33. And we see somewhere between 2.328 and 2.329, we have our sign change. And so we just play the same game again. And then we do it again for the next level. And now we have a pretty good approximation about uh, 2.3288, 3. I'm sorry, 2.3289. 
And just by doing this a few times in Excel, we can get a really good estimate of where the answer is. I also put no faith in trying to get more than one or two decimal digits for something like this. This is an approximation to reality. I don't expect the third, fourth, fifth decimal digits to have any real meaning. Quick calculation like this is more than enough to get a sense of what's going on. And you can just keep doing this again and again and again. And this is a really good thought process to have. How can you approximate the solution? I don't need the actual solution. I just need something that's a really good approximation. And here we're getting it by just playing a few games in Excel. Any questions about how you would do this? It would be wonderful if we had a answer for C in terms of runs scored and runs allowed and winning percentage. So you input runs scored, runs allowed, winning percentage in an output C in closed form so that you can just vary any of those parameters and immediately get the answer. That's like the quadratic formula where I give you, you know, AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. I give you ABC, you immediately know the two groups. It's wonderful when you have something like that. Most of the time, we don't. This is the 21st century. Uh, I know we have a, well, we were actually having a conversation, or some people were having a conversation before class started on what is the definition of a young person. I like the idea of somebody who could be useful to an old person if I myself am considered an old person and not a young person. We have several generations represented in this class. When I was in high school, we were not taught how to use slide rulers, but I am sure some people here will probably taught that. Uh, let's see if I actually remember to bring it. Um, we were taught how to use trig tables, and we were taught how to use log tables, and we were taught how to plot things by hand. And so, what is taught has greatly changed. How many of you were taught how to use trig tables to evaluate trig functions? Okay, so that has changed. Um, I am going to just do a, a screen share for a moment to make a family member happy. And so this is from one of my father's cousin's husbands. She doesn't have multiple husbands. Uh, that is a little bit unclear. Feels like space balls. This is a tie clip slide rule. And so his sons went into law and medicine and they had absolutely no use for this. And I said, oh, I will take it and I will wear it proudly. So I was never taught how to use a slide rule. It's interesting how things change. We're in the 21st century. It's okay if the formula is a little bit complicated. It's okay if you're approximating things a little bit. We can do that easily on the computer in almost no time. And I want you to get into that mindset. Okay. Any other questions on the first homework assignment, the first problem? And then as I said before, if you're trying to do a mathematical model, people often split things up into even years, odd years, and you assume that there's no difference between the two. You use one to create your model to fit your parameters, and then you use the other ones to check. If you use all of your data, then it's hard to check it at the end unless you wait until you have a new data. And you always have to be careful, is there a reason to view some of the data differently? 2020, you know, this would be the year of the asterisks in almost any study because of what the pandemic response has done. Seasons in baseball when this strikes, again, very different responses. Okay, so uh, question number two. Assume one scored and allowed a discrete integer random variables. The modeling class assumed that they were independent, come up with a situation where you do not expect them to be independent and discuss what terms you might add to the run scored, runs allowed variable to account for this interaction. So there's lots of ways you could attack this. And one thing is to actually break things down into a fundamental level of how do runs, how do you create runs scored and runs allowed? And there are formulas to predict how many runs a team will score? What inputs do you think go into that model? Does 
you're trying to predict how many runs a team will score, what do you think you need to know? I'm sorry? The number of well, we're trying to figure out how many runs do we think this team is going to score in a given season. So what do you think we need to know? About how good the hitters are. How good the hitters are, or even more general, who the hitters are. Who is your team? You might even need to know the batting order. And there's a lot of studies as to how can you get more runs out of your lineup by changing where people bat. You might want to know how fast they are. You might want to have some sense of what kind of pitching are they going to face. You might want to have some sense of what ballpark are you playing in. Different people are more valuable in one, ball, in one ballpark or another. Does anybody know what protection means in baseball? Anybody have any idea what protection means in baseball? Big ballpark? Not a big ballpark. If you get good hitters hitting. Count on the other guy getting hit. Good. I, I, I heard somebody else speaking up just a second ago. When you have good hitters sitting behind someone in the batting order. So when you have good hitters sitting beside, behind somebody in the batting order, if you are a really good hitter, and people next to you in the batting order suck, then it's okay to walk you. But if there's good hitters after you, they might be a little hesitant to put you on base. And so I, I hate showing statistics for Barry Bonds, but you know, in 2004, he had 232 walks in 617 plate appearances. He actually only had 373 at-bats. A, a, a walk does not count as an at-bat. If you look at intentional walks, he had 120 intentional walks where the other team basically just decided go to first. There's a beautiful Onion article where they say a uh, pitcher is fined, or oh, I'm sorry, a pitcher is going to be penalized for not throwing at Barry Bonds and will have a mandatory five-day Bahama vacation at the end of the season. 120 times he just walked because they didn't want to pitch to him. Of the remaining times he walked, the remaining um, 112, the question is how many of these were semi-intentional walks where they were willing to pitch to him but not give him anything good and if he walks, he walks. And this is a great illustration of how effective or ineffective somebody is based on who else you have. When you're trying to think about adding someone to your lineup or your team, it's not independent of who else is on the team. If you have a team with a lot of really great hitters, adding another really great hitter may not be that valuable to you. But going to another team, the value could be tremendously more. And this is another great way to illustrate the power of relativeness. That you know, what is your worth? It depends on the situation. What is your value? It depends on the situation. You're very similar to different responses to you know, stuff with the pandemic. And so when we're trying to answer the homework question, of you know, what could we do? You know, one of the easy things we talked about was that if you have a huge lead, you might pull some of your good players and give other people a chance. <laughs> the other team might pull their good players and give their players a chance. And so it could become really interesting as to what happens. You, know, you might actually say, well, we are trailing by so much, we consider the game over, and we're gonna just put in our weak pitches because somebody's got to throw the ball. We had a disaster of a game last night, which is really bad for our team's playoff chances. Uh, this is being recorded. We had an umpire who had a terrific strike zone. And what was nice is most people discriminate and have a fixed strike zone that's constant throughout the game, whereas this umpire was kind enough to allow every part of space to have some time where it is the strike zone. Uh, if anybody could figure out mathematically when something was going to be a strike, because it varied from pitch to pitch. I've never seen a game with so many walks. Uh, there were almost 20 runs scored between the two teams, almost no hits. 
And it was just a nightmare in terms of your know, pitching and what's happened. And so, you know, in the end, we have potentially several other games. We gave, I won't say we gave up, but we needed to preserve pitches for future games and we needed people to just finish off. And so in terms of trying to calculate, you know, what's going on here, to me, the most natural one is adjusting for what happens when you have a large lead. And it's always an interesting question as to when you consider the lead is so insurmountable that you can stop trying. Okay, any other questions on this one? Okay, for the third one, uh, the variables were chosen because they easily integrate uh, when we have a product of two of them. What other functions can we integrate easily? And for those of you who have taken calculus, this is the great lie of Calc 2. If you take Calc 2, you leave the class thinking you can integrate. You can't. I can't. No one can. Integration is incredibly hard. As much as I want to be a pain in the ass and give terrible problems on exams, I can't do that in Calc 1. I can't give a function that you can't differentiate. You can just keep whittling away and just hacking at it by using the differentiation rules. You know, if you hear the word of, you know, cosine of, you immediately think chain rule. And you just keep using these and you hammer it down into more and more fundamental things. I can't stump you. Integration is the opposite. I have to work hard to give you a problem that you can actually integrate. Most functions do not have nice antiderivatives. And it gets even worse when you have to do a two dimensional integral. So in Calc 2, the two main tools we have are switching the order of integration and doing some kind of change of variables. You often hear the spherical, polar, cylindrical, there's other coordinates you can use. When do you think you want to use spherical coordinates? What kind of integration surface? Yes, a sphere, right? There's a reason it's called spherical. When do you think you want to use cylindrical coordinates? When you have a cylinder. Polar is hard. It's not when you're on the north or the south pole, it's when you have a circle. But there's a couple of natural choices for changing variables. So the question is, you know, can you come up with other functions where you can do things in closed form? And so, you know, turning to the solution key, there's a couple things we can do. And I did not bother normalizing things as well as possible. And so here, uh, I took sine x squared and sine x cubed as my two functions, and I wanted to integrate one squared is proportional to sine of x squared, and the number of ones allowed is proportional to sine of y cubed. This should be some normalization constants so that they integrate to one. I didn't bother putting them down. If I can do this integration, I can do them all. I may have shared this quote before when I was a physics student in college one of my professors gave me the following advice. You should have two table of integrals on you. You should have the big monster that you keep in your dorm room, and you should have the small portable table of integrals that is always on you. So if you have to integrate at a moment's notice, you have that available. The big monster, um, I actually have that, it's still in my office. Sometimes when I go for walks with students, I actually put in my backpack for exercise and just a little bit of you know, weights to carry. It's huge. It has a tremendous amount of stuff. And it's not always easy to use because you have to very similar to algebra. They can't list every integral in it. So how do I convert what I have to the form that's in the book? But nowadays, there are programs like Mathematica where you can go online to Wolf of Alpha and you can ask it, hey, can you integrate this for me? And it will turn out the answer. It's good to know that these resources exist. And so if I want to integrate sine of x squared sine of y cubed over various regions, I can just plug this into Wolfram Alpha or Mathematica, and it will tell me, yes, the answer is pi over three. I love that as a possible winning percentage. But of course, I have to normalize this so that these both integrate to one. So you can actually experiment a little bit and see which ones of these can we actually do in closed form. Other things that you can do is you can do polynomials. You can always integrate polynomials against polynomials. So if we restrict the maximum number of runs scored, we can do something like this. 
The next thing, which I don't really talk about uh, here, and I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, let's see if I can actually switch. Okay. So let's say we can do, can integrate signs and polynomials. And we talked about what we could do if we can integrate to the product of two signs. So we can do, say, sine of the eighth power, sine of y to the bth power. But if you looked at that, you know, that gave us something that looked you know, roughly like this. And that's not the most general form. Any thoughts as to how we could try to get a more general function if we can do powers of signs? So one thing we can do is we could do linear combinations. Instead of looking at sine of x to the a, let's look at maybe a sum of you know, alpha k sine a k x plus beta k. And so what we're doing now is we're just taking a bunch of pieces where each piece we can do individually and just adding a bunch of them. And that's going to give us a much more general function. And the betas will be simple shifts. And if you use your, your uh, trig identities, you know, we know the sine of x plus beta k is you know, the sine of x cosine beta k plus cosine x sine of beta k. This is a constant. This is a constant. And so we'll just get more trick things again if we put in shifts like this. So there's a bunch of games we can play to try to get a more general function. You know, a little bit similar to chemistry where you start off with something simple and you combine it and you make a more complicated structure. Start off with something really simple that you can work with and try to build to something more involved. Okay. The last thing I was, uh, was there a question? Okay. Um, I see some comment about wanting baseball savvy fans. Um, I've been upset for years that a lot of times the World Series games are on too late for kids to watch. I, the last problem was one of my favorites. And I wish I had thought of this problem when I was writing a book in probability. So we have a couple of properties of the gamma function. So the gamma function is defined as this integral. It generalizes the factorial function. So if s is the integer n, then gamma of n plus one is n factorial. And there's a good reason for why we have a shift like that. And the question I ask you is approximate gamma of one over n when n is very large. And one thing you could do is you could actually just go to Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha and just have it calculate a couple of values for you and get some intuition. So as a rule of thumb, if you can compute something, compute it. See the data, try to get a sense of what the answer is. And so, here are values of n and gamma of 1 over n. When you look at this, there is a conjecture, I think, that is screaming at you as to, hmm, it seems like gamma of 1 over n, when n is large, is approximately n. And when you have that, now you have some idea of maybe what you want to try to prove. And so it's wonderful when the data can be so illuminating. It turns out that there is a one-line solution to this. And the idea is we know gamma of s plus one is s gamma of s. So normally we're using this to find the value at s plus one, knowing the value at s, but we can do it the other way. We can solve for gamma of s as gamma of s plus one divided by s. And the reason that's nice is when we now look at gamma of one plus one over n, did I write that out? 
Gamma of s plus one is s gamma of s, which implies gamma of s is gamma of s plus one divided by s. And so gamma of s plus one is the integral from zero to infinity of x to the s plus one minus one e to the negative x dx. So gamma of one plus one over n is just the integral from zero to infinity of x the one over n e to the minus x dx. And when n is very large, x to the one over n, for most x gets very close to one. If x is larger than one, x to the one over n comes crashing down to one. If x is less than one, x to the one over n rises up to one. So for instance, if you take the square root of one fourth, you get one half. If you take the cube root of one eighth, you get one half. You can see that as you take a higher root, you're moving up more and more and more. And so this part over here is approximately one. Oh, well, we can do that integral. So what we want to do is we replace x to the one over n as one plus x to the one over n minus one. And now we just have to figure out how close is one to x to the one over n? And because we have an e to the negative x, as x starts to get very, very large, I don't care if x to the one over n isn't that close to one, the e to the negative x is just gonna kill it tremendously and it's not gonna matter. And so the question is, how good of a job can you do estimating? How well can you evaluate the error term? And I go through the solution key in great detail I split um, the integral from zero to infinity into zero to blah, plus blah to blah, plus blah, uh, I'm going to do blah prime, blah prime to infinity. You split the interval into different parts. And the reason is in each interval, we can use different levels of approximation. When I'm over here, e to the minus x kills all. I don't have to be that close for x to the one over n and one because the e to the minus x is killing it so tremendously. And then in the other regions, I can sometimes play different games as to how I would estimate. And so maybe things are a little bit different as x gets very close to zero or as x starts to rise. And so you have all these different games in terms of where do you want to split. And so a lot of times when you're trying to do things, you may not know immediately where you want to put the bounds. You can try something, or what you could do is you could put some bounds as maybe this is going to go integral zero to infinity would be the integral from zero a of n plus the integral from a of n to b of n plus the integral from b of n to infinity. And if you play games like that, you give yourself a little bit of freedom. And you can wait and see how things are going and then try to figure out what choices do I want? Well, for the first interval, how large can I take a n and still have things be small? Because in this interval, e to the minus x is gonna be very close to one. There's gonna be no decay from that. Similarly for the last one, you know, what size do I need, how large do I need bn to be before that part is small? And you have these different games and you have these different games. <laughs> If A of N is at least this, we're okay. If B of N is at most this, we're okay. And you can play games like that back and forth. Okay, any other questions on these parts? Okay, so what I want to do for the last few minutes is talk about the problem that converted me from primarily being a physicist to primarily being a mathematician. So for those of you who are taking real analysis, if you've ever seen Rudin's book, Principles of Mathematical Analysis, it's also called Baby Rudin, it's also called The Blue Book. If you say any of these things to a older mathematician, very high likelihood they will know what you're talking about. So absolutely wonderful book with terrific problems. 
If you are thinking right now, I'm in 119, I haven't done calculus, don't worry. Most of this part can be done without calculus. To prove how good of a job it does, you need calculus. And that will probably be assigned to the 300 level people uh, just because I enjoy those problems so much. It is related to chaos and fractals. And so I don't know how much time we're going to have to get into everything, but if people are interested, I'm happy to talk more about this. Uh, it's not bad to be aware of chaos and sensitivity. When you think about all the models being used in COVID, there are tremendous concerns about how much would changing a parameter by a small amount change the outcome of the model. So much of math is about solving equations. So hopefully you've all seen how to solve linear equations, ax plus b equals not a big deal, subtract b, divide by a, and you get x is negative b over a. You've learned the sing song for the quadratic form. It's negative b plus minus b over b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And then it turns out for cubic quarter degree three, degree four, there are explicit closed form solutions in terms of the coefficients. For degree five and higher, they no longer exist. It's a beautiful theory as to why, in general, we can't do this. Uh, for fun, here are the three solutions for the cubic. No one, for the most part, memorizes this. Digits of pi, yes. Solutions to the cubic, no. You could make your life a little bit easier. You can do a little bit of a translation. You can assume without loss of generality that b equals zero. You can rescale without loss of generality a equals one. It's still bad. There is a formula for the degree four. I've had to compress the font size. I apologize to anybody who's watching this on a phone or small screen right now. This is just one of the four solutions. But we do have explicit formulas for this. We can see how things will change. All right, so we already talked earlier today about divide and conquer. I might not have used the phrase before, but this is essentially what we were doing when we had the Excel sheet to find what's the best value of C. You know, if it's negative here, and it's positive here, it must cross zero somewhere in between. Uh, a nice way to do this uh, to entertain little kids, which I've done over the years, is I can guess your birthday in at most 10 questions. I'm not going to go, is it January 1? Is it January 2? Is it January 3? Is it January 4? If I'm wrong, you have to say earlier or later in the year. So what should be my first guess for your birthday? Yes. July 1st, something like that. And you might go, well, February doesn't have as many days as the other months unless it's a leap year, and even then it's still short. And July and August both have 31. Maybe I'll do July 2nd. July 1st is close enough. So you guess July 1st, and if they say earlier, then you know it's somewhere in the first half, and you go maybe April 1st. You go, keep doing the midpoint. And 10 questions will be enough. Two to the 10th is 1024. And so I'm not going to go through the details here about, you know, the divide and conquer. I'll just show you what happens when you apply it to try to find the square root of 3. So the square root of 3 is approximately 1.732051. And if I do divide and conquer, you know, I've done 10 iterations. And after 10 iterations, I know it's somewhere between 1.730469 and 1.732422. The correct answer does thankfully fall in that region. You know, Math would be very bad if it didn't. Every time I do this, I have my uncertainty. So if I do it 10 times, my uncertainty decreases by a factor of 1 over 2 to the 10. 2 to the 10, 1,000 times is about 1,000. So if I do this 10 times, I basically gain another three digits. If I do it another 10 times, I gain another three digits. So I have standard gains. I know what I'm going to get, but it's going to take some time. Newton's method is far better. And the reason it's better is it uses more information about your function. It uses differentiability. And one of the big things you should learn from a calculus class is that locally, every nice function is a straight line. Every differentiable function locally is a straight line. How well that straight line approximates, how far you can go, depends on the second derivative. And so what the idea is, you draw the tangent line to the function at that point and basically say, screw the function I'm given with, I'm going to just deal with the straight line. And so I take my function and I draw the tangent line and I see where the tangent line hits the x-axis. And I call that point of intersection my next guess for the root. 
And then lather, rinse, repeat, it's the shampoo instructions of mathematics. We look at where this hits the curve, we draw the tangent line there, and where that hits, that's our next guess. And you just keep it away. You do it again and again and again. And so what you can do is you can write down the equation of the tangent line going to the point xn f of xn with slope f prime of xn. And when the dust settles, you get y minus f of xn is f prime of xn, x minus xn. The next solution is going to be when it hits the x-axis. So y is going to be 0 there. x is going to be xn plus 1, the next guess. And when you solve, you get xn plus 1 is xn. Great, that was my previous guess. And this tells me how much I move. f of xn divided by f prime of xn. So if I apply this to the function x squared minus 3, after doing a little bit of algebra, I get xn plus 1 is 1 half xn plus 3 over xn. Whenever you have a formula, you always want to ask, is it reasonable? Can you give me a value of xn where you know what xn plus 1 should be if things are working? Root 3. If xn is root 3, then we're at the root. We shouldn't move at all. And you see that if you take xn equals root 3, you get 3 divided by root 3, which is root 3. Root 3 plus root 3 is 2 root 3. Divided by 2 is root 3. Great. If you take xn to be 100, well, 100 plus 3 over 100, that's still essentially 100. Divided by 2, around 50. So you can see it's coming crashing down and heading towards hopefully square root of 3. So the formula looks reasonable. And now let's see how well it does. And this is what converted me to mathematics. So I'm going to take my initial guess for the square root of 3 to be 2. This is not a particularly great guess. It's a nice integer to make things nice. My next guess becomes 7 fourths or 1.75. That's not bad. The correct answer is around 1.732. And what a 1.75. The next guess, you get 97.56. 1 1.732.14. 1 1.732.05. So off by 0 0.00009, roughly. That's not bad after just two iterations. And we have a nice number like 9756. You will always get rational numbers as you do this, which is wonderful when you're working on a computer. If I do the next level, the third, 1.732050081, 1 1.732050807, so I'm off by about 0 0.00000003. 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 I wrote here what happens when you do it five times and just how far you have to go with five iterations before you find a disagreement. And to me, this was absolutely amazing how powerful this is. It's just take my guess, take three, divide by my guess, add that to the guess, and take half of that, take the average of them. You can generalize this to cube roots, to any roots you want, and you will still get these beautiful formulas. Essentially, every time you iterate, you double the number of decimal digits you have. So divide and conquer slow, slow, three digits, three digits, three digits, three digits. Newton's double every single time. So here's where things get a little fun. So let's consider the function x squared minus one equals zero. So it has roots at one and negative one. And then what we're going to do is we're going to apply Newton's method and we're going to see if we keep applying this, where is our point going to iterate to? So if we guess, do you think it's going to iterate to the red root? to the blue root, or not iterate to any root. So if I give you 16, what do you think 16 will go to? So if I apply, you know, x0 is 16, I will get 16 plus 1 16th over 2, and I apply that as my x1, and I apply that as my x2, and I keep iterating. If I start with my initial guess of 16, where do you think I end up? I end up at 1. If I start at negative 16, where do you think I end up? Thank you. And you can see that if you start negative, you stay negative. If you start positive, you stay positive. What do you think happens if I try to do this at zero? Can I do this at, yes. I'm sorry? Yeah, it's undetermined. I can't divide by zero. So the method blows up and it has no prediction at zero. And so if you look at the color coding, it's exactly what you would expect. So this is nice. 
If you start off with a positive guess, you iterate to the positive root. If you start off with a negative guess, you iterate to the negative root. If you start off at zero, which is halfway in between, you shouldn't have any preference one way or the other. All right, let's move things to the complex plane. So let's look at x cubed minus one equals zero. So complex numbers, so i is the square root of negative one. And so it turns out you can do polynomial long division. So if you remember this, we know that if I take x equals one, one cubed minus one equals zero, so I can see a root. Or if you remember the rational root test from algebra all those years ago, if I have a polynomial, the possible rational roots, you know, p over q in lowest terms, p divides, um, The denominator q divides the leading term here, which is one, and then the numerator divides the constant term. So the only things we have to try are plus or minus one. One works. We then long division, and we find it's x squared plus x plus one is the other factor. That's degree two. We can fortunately solve it. And we can actually write the solutions to this in closed form, which is wonderful. It's not a surprise we're choosing this problem. It's nice to have a problem where you know what the answers are so you can compare and see how well the method is working. So here are three different roots. Here is our root at one and then the two other complex roots. How do you think the plane is divided so that if I choose, this is my initial guess, what root do you think I should go to, blue, red, or green? If I choose over here, what should I go to? If I choose right here at the origin. Yes. Nothing. What if I choose up here? What do you think I should go to if I choose up here? Red, blue, or green? Red. So what, can you give me a nice rule in English? Go to the root which is closest. So if we divide the plane into three, and since this is Williams, we'll do it with purple. If you are in this third of the plane, the red root is closest. This third, the green root is closest. And this third, the blue root is closest. OK. What I want to do now. What happens if, if you're on the line, on one of the purple lines? So if you're in something like that, you may uh, end up not converging to anything. All right, so hopefully this will work. I'm not sure if there's going to be cheesy music. There often is. So this is zooming in. They have their colors chosen a little bit differently than the order I have. But what you can see is this incredibly complex structure that if I move just a little bit, you know, this over here, these points are all closest to the blue. They're all going to blue. That's great. These are closest to green. That's great. But right over here, this point is far closer to the green or the blue root than it is to the red root, but it actually goes to the red root. And very small changes can lead to wildly different results. And so I'll let it, you know, zoom in for a little bit more. And this is just you know, one of many examples of you know, fractals and incredibly complicated behavior you can have with very simple systems and very simple rules. You know, the rule is not that bad. I'm basically looking at nice ratio. Did it just go to block? Or... Uh, it's getting really dark for some reason. OK. I'll just go back over here just to you know, zoom in again and just see that very, very small changes of behavior lead to wildly different answers. Okay. Any questions before we sign off? Okay, on Monday, we will have a guest lecturer, a Williams alum, who will be guiding us in a philosophy and medical ethics conversation. On Wednesday, I believe we have President Mandel will be speaking, and then on Friday, I think it's one of the uh, economics groups that will be talking. Have a great weekend, all.